Hello, it's Oscars weekend and I'm in Cambridge to meet Jane Hawking, the first wife of acclaimed physicist Stephen Hawking, to find out how her belief in God kept her going as she lived with his debilitating illness and his atheism. And I'm here in the West End to meet Hollywood actor David Iyelowo and find out how faith was his inspiration when playing Dr. Martin Luther King in the Oscar-nominated film Selma. I heard God tell me that I was going to play this role. I heard him say, you're going to play Dr. King. And history is made at the British Library, where the four original copies of Magna Carta are brought together for the first time. And we have some fantastic music from around the UK to sing along to. Plus, we'll have a performance from one of the School Choir of the Year semi-finalists. But we start with a hymn to mark the beginning of Lent. And it's also one of Jane Hawking's favourites. British film The Theory of Everything is well represented at tonight's Oscars. Based on the memoirs of Stephen Hawking's first wife Jane, it's an insight into their real-life relationship as they struggle with his motor neuron disease. If you care about me at all, then please just go. I can't. I have two years to live. I need to work. I love you. you you've left her. That's a false conclusion. I want to find out what it was like for Jane to live not only with a genius, but an atheist, and to care for him whilst raising a young family. However bad life may seem, while there is life, there is hope. Jane, lovely to see you here in St John's College, where a lot of the filming took place for the movie. What was it like seeing yourself up there on the big screen? The film started, and there was Felicity playing me. And I thought, this is really weird. I'm sitting here in the cinema, but I'm also on the screen. And she had captured my movements, my speech patterns, my gestures so well that it really was me. You're young, Jane. Tragedy strikes. Stephen is very, very ill. Why did you decide to marry him? There was no question in my mind. I loved him and I wanted to do my very best for him so that he could fulfill his... Uh, potential and his ambitions in whatever time was given to him. And I knew he was amazingly intelligent, that he was uh, charming and he had a lovely sense of humour. And he had wonderful grey eyes. So I, I really wanted to devote myself to him for as long as it took. There. That's better, isn't it? Yes. So raising a young family, Jane, three, three young children, as well as caring for Stephen, it can't have been easy. Um, it was fine at first because I did have so much energy, 
but with Stephen on one arm and a six-week-old baby on the other, and all the flying and having two more children, I really got to a state of exhaustion. But you've got a lot of strength now. You oh, seem leading, very and fit leading and healthy. A, a normal and very enjoyable life now. What was it like, Jane, living with uh, one of the brightest minds in the world um, and he didn't believe in God? What was it like for you? It wasn't a problem at first because Stephen didn't flaunt his atheism. And uh, my faith is something very personal and I don't try to impose it on anybody else because I respect their points of view. So we lived in harmony for a very long time. And it was latterly that Stephen became more of a pronounced atheist. And I suppose that was really because if you're um, diagnosed with a terminal illness when you're very young, it would be very difficult to believe in a benevolent God. And also, Stephen is a scientist, so how could he be expected to take a leap of faith into something that you couldn't prove? Do you think perhaps, Jane, your own faith helped carry you through? Without my faith, I would have gone under. I needed the support of believing that there was something greater. And uh, often things happened which rather belied Stephen's um, atheism. For instance, the fact that he doesn't believe in miracles, but I believe that it's a miracle, a miracle of modern science, a miracle of medicine, that he is actually still with us. And later in the programme, we'll be hearing how music plays a part in Jane Hawking's life today. But now, actor David Oyelowo first came to prominence in the hit BBC series Spooks. David Grant talks to him now about his latest role, playing the civil rights activist Martin Luther King in the Oscar-nominated movie Selma. Mr President, in the South there have been thousands of racially motivated murders. We need your help, Dr. King. This thing's just gonna have to wait. It cannot wait. You got one big issue, I got 101. On the 24th of July, 2007, I heard God tell me that I was going to play this role. 
I heard him say, you're going to play Dr. King in the film Selma, which was a shocking revelation to me because I'm a British actor. I hadn't done any of the uh, American films I, I have now done uh, in the intervening seven and a half years. So that's why I know the date, because I wrote it down in my prayer diary because I was shocked by it. Um, uh, buoyed by this fact, I just helped me, my wife uh, helped me put four scenes on tape for the uh, director at the time. Unfortunately for me, he didn't agree with God. And so it started with rejection. So and did you uh, think, okay, that's it, I got it wrong? No. I, I was indignant rather than despondent. Mm. I, doesn't this guy know who God is? Clearly not. Um, and that director came and went, and it wasn't until 2010 that I actually did get cast. But still, we couldn't get the film made. In the meantime, I had done this film where I played Oprah Winfrey's son. We had become very close, and I shared my dream to play Dr. King, and she said, I believe this is your calling, David, and I am going to do everything I can to help you get this done. Really? Yeah. What physical changes did you have to take to inhabit the physicality of Martin Luther King? About two and a half stone will do it, and uh, growing a moustache, which is n not hard to do. <laughs> um, uh, sh shaving one's hairline back and all that kind of stuff. The really tough stuff was the spiritual work uh, mm. needed to inhabit someone of this spiritual stature. When you see Dr. King giving those speeches, you know that this is a man called of God to do what he did. And for me, it was a question of, gosh, how do we how do we depict that? How do we get that on film? We will not wait any longer. Yes. Give us the vote. That's right. No more. We're not asking. We're demanding. Give us the vote. The speeches are stirring. The words inspiring. But they were of their time. Do you think that those words matter today? more so than ever, I feel, because I think there is something truly timeless and universal about the power of love in the face of hate. It's what Jesus professed when the Bible says, greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friend, is what uh, Dr. King lived out. And if we all, in our own ways, were living that out, the world would be a very, very different place. Here the demonstrators knelt in prayer. You're a Christian who is a movie star living in Hollywood. Are there any conflicting elements in those two positions? If I have a role that I'm unsure about, I pray about it, and thankfully, it turns out God has good taste. Um, he tells me what he thinks I should do and the things I should stay away from. If God says go, I go.